Today's project is going to include finishing a small bear skin. Uh, we don't live in bear, country, bear area, so most of the bears I get come in skinned out with the skull still in place and the paw still intact. Tail's usually still in, there's still usually a pile of fat on them. This, this little bear today is going to be for life size. Little life size mount. He's not a big bear. They said he weighed 103 pounds. So it's just a small, small bear. Big, cute little mount. But since it's life size, we're not going to cut up the throat. If it was a rug, we'd start about six inches back on the jaw and we'd cut down to the center line and make skin and the head out easier. This is a life size, so I don't want to have to worry about sewing that up and having the stitches show. So this bear is not completely thawed out yet. That's an important part we always do. If you train your customers to roll it up so the paws and the head are on the outside of the skin, it'll usually thaw out overnight for you. You don't want it to be completely thawed out because the longer it thaws, bears are really bad for growing bacteria and slipping. So you want to get on this skinning job as soon as possible. So as soon as you can get the skin in it, get at it and get it in the salt. But when we skin a bear, our first step is going to be opening these lips up. We're just going to take our scalpel and we're going to peel, peel the lips back, holding the lips. Now I always keep my borax handy so I keep my, dries, my hands dry. If my hands stay dry, I slip less and cut myself less. Get a better hold of stuff, but I'm just going to completely peel this bottom and chop, top jaw back so when I come down over the skull, it comes out fairly easy. When you, anytime you take a bear in for a life size or a rug, if you like to do or don't mind boiling them, hit them up to boil that skull and make another 60, 70, 80 bucks on your bear, depending on what you can get for skulls in your area. Bears. They were open up in the mouth area. So now we're just going to try to invert this head and start skinning down. As I said, it still froze a little, so it's going to be a little tough this morning. You can use, use a sharp knife or scalpel, whatever you prefer to get this moving. These, this bear happened to have the skull on the outside, but the paws were rolled up inside to hide. So when I got here this morning, I took it out of the freezer last night. When I got here this morning, it, the skull was thawed out. I unrolled it, but the paws were still froze solid. So I hung it good enough to let the paws all stay loose about, you know, it's probably been two and a half hours and they're finally at the point they can be skinned. As I said, there's still some frozen spots on it, but while we're working it and flashing it, they'll, they'll thaw loose. But this is all practice again. You learn how to skin. You got to learn where these ear butts attach to the skull. Like this one I just cut off, cut loose. You know, learn the anatomy of your animal. I always cut them ear butts as deep to the skull as I can. I can trim off the excess later when I can see, when I got it opened up and I can see what I'm doing, but you don't want to cut them too, too far up and have a wide open ear when you go to mount it. So get them cut close to the skull when you're taking it off the head. Now that the ears are loose, as you can see, we just keep working our way around the skull, turning it over, going down the bottom jaw, top. I just keep flipping around on my table. And as I said, skin any animal you can find for a while so you get used to where you have to cut the skin. Find animals that you're not going to mount for practicing on. 
Then you'll learn your anatomy of the animals. And you'll learn how to cut into the eyes. You'll learn where to tell that the eyes are. Now we're getting close to the eyes. I know the eyes are up a little higher in the ear and they're in front of the ear. So I'm going to be careful going down the side here until I find where that eyeball is. There I'm down to the bottom jaw. I just cut that bottom jaw loose. On that side I just went right through the meat and cut that side loose. I'll work around. Again I stay back far enough on them lips when I cut through to make sure that I leave all the lips intact. Now we're going to be careful going around the eyeball here. I always keep pressure pulling out so I don't cut the lid. I cut deep enough that there we just cut through that first eye. Went through that one. Now we're going to flip it over and repeat that process on the other side. Just stay deep enough. And like I said, find any deer mounts, raccoons, anything you can find the skin to get practice and then you'll learn how to stay deep enough without cutting the eyelids and how to properly skin if you've never skinned before. There, we've already got the skull removed. We're going to lay that aside so we can take measurements of it later for our mount. There's the head turned inside out. Our next step is going to be to start on the ears. We've got to turn them ears inside out so that we can salt them. And for mounting purposes, they have to be turned. We've got to split the lips. Trim the excess fat. I trim the eyeballs at this point so there's no excess meat and stuff on them. But our first step is we go back to the bar that I made, just direct, just slopes from about an inch and a quarter, it's probably 14 inches long. I just use that to get leverage inside in a minute. Right now I'm just going to start cutting, trimming these ears, and I'll keep going around until I get to the butt area. I don't want to cut through that butt, I just want to get skinned all the way. And this again, you're going to make some mistakes at first, so I would find some deer that your buddy shoot, deer that you shoot, it can even be a doe to practice on. But this, these ears and lips are something you should practice. Even, even if you're not going to be a taxidermist, just a hunter should know, know these steps. If he's out in the woods, he can better preserve his hides. Elk, deer, bear, whatever he shoots, he can't get the... Right now I'm just trimming the excess meat off these ear butts. So that all I got is cartilage. There, I've got that ear butt started. I'm going to push this bar up into the ear and I'm going to use it to keep pressure inside so that I can trim these ears all the way to the edges. And I'm just going to keep turning them inside out as I go. That's basically what we're doing is there's two, there's actually there's three layers in there but you're split between the cartilage and the back of the ear. The cartilage will stay with the inside of the ear and the back will just be skin and when we go to mount this we might remove that cartilage in some animals. Bears I don't. Bears I'll leave the cartilage in there at all times. This is, this is a process that I believe every hunter that's ever going to hunt out in the woods and away from home should know. This ain't only for the taxidermists. This is something you taxidermists need to teach your hunters so that they better prepare their capes and their hides to bring into you. This, this complete skin job is a very important process if they can't get to the a freezer right away with these animals. 
I always I always use the analogy. They wonder they wonder how long a hide will last once the animal's dead. Here's how I kind of put it: If you throw a T-bone steak on top of that animal and let it set, whether it be out in the open or however you take care of it, that T-bone steak stays right with it. And if you'd eat that T-bone steak the day you take that animal into the taxidermist, that animal should be good. If you wouldn't eat that T-bone steak, then that means you're afraid of deterioration. And these hides will deteriorate just as fast as that T-bone steak will. Sometimes only hours, not even days, hours these things will start to go bad if the heat, if the temperature's wrong and the conditions are wrong. As you can see, I'm just slowly working all the way around that ear, turning it completely inside out. Trying to get as close to the edges as I can without going through them. And this is a one of them deals, even if you had an instructor standing right here, he could do it for you and show you what it looks like. Or he could make you do it and then look at your mistakes when you're done. You're going to make some mistakes early, you're going to go through that hide, you're going to go too close to the edges and cut through, or you're not going to go far enough. It's all going to be something you're going to have to learn and deal with as you go. But there is a completely ear turned inside out. We're going to do the other one quick. Now, if I wasn't showing and explaining, I can do these pretty fast. I don't like to leave this excess meat on the earbud when I send it to the tannery because it's just a hard glob of leather when it comes back and it's hard to, harder to deal with then than it is now so I always trim that meat off of the cartilage at the ear butt and that way I don't have to deal with it when it comes back from the tannery and I go to mount it. I use a number 23 blade from Havels Incorporated. I like the thicker handle. They've got thinner handles. You got to find the scalpel you like, the blade you like. Um, I think it's the 22 blade that a lot of people use over the 23. I like the blade that isn't as round, comes more to the edge. But you try all the different stuff, different ways. And come up with your your preference because what you feel comfortable with is what you're going to do the best job with. Same with same with any aspect of taxidermy that any of us are trying to train you. You pick and choose the ways you want to do stuff that feels best to you. Your style. As you keep pressure on this, you can see where you need to cut. Now you can use a blunt screwdriver instead of this bar I have. If I was doing this out in the woods, I'd probably just find a stick to shove up in there to push on something with a blunt edge. You know, you can try a lot of different things. I mean, I wouldn't carry this piece of rod out in the woods because it's just that much more weight to carry. I've actually got little piranha scalpel knives that I can throw blades on that fold up for carrying. So that's what I would have in my hunting bag if I was out in the woods.
these little these little blades are easy to carry. In all honesty, when it comes to skinning something, if there was only one tool I had, I'd take the scalpel and 20 blades and I could skin this complete bear from start to finish. This bear's already got dry tips on this ear. He's been in the freezer a little long without being protected the way it feels. But we're gonna get him. He's all the way to the edge. There's the second ear turned. Now we're gonna move to the nose and the lips. We're gonna start around the nose a little bit. Trimming, we're gonna cut right down the center of that nose where it came off the skull. Very carefully cutting all the way to the pad without trimming them nostrils off. So you have to practice that too. But you can see the center, you can stay in between the two sets of nostrils. Get down to the skull, get that opened up. So that the salt will get down in there when you go to salt it. There's the nose opened up. I'm just going to trim a little bit of that inside nasal passage off. I don't need that much from coming back from the tannery when it comes back. I'll probably leave a half inch is all. And I go through a couple scal or scalpel blades doing this job. I'd rather work with a sharp one. They're only less than a quarter a piece as long as you buy them right. But now I'm going to start the corner of the mouth where the skin is. You can see what the lip looks like right now. We're going to turn, we're going to split between these two, two deals. Just kind of think of it as flaying a steak. You're taking that steak and you're cutting down the center till you actually have two sides that are attached by a thin membrane at the bottom. That's what we're going to do right now. Is we're going to turn these lips just like we would butterfly a steak. I, always, I usually start at the back corner of one side of the mouth and I'll just work my way all the way through and around the complete, complete lip area. Always got my finger, my thumb, something underneath right at the point where I'm headed towards. That way I can feel when I'm getting close. I can just, I've learned how to feel where my scalpel is and how thick this is yet. I'm not taking, I'm probably for the most part working a half inch at a time here. And I'll work it towards the edge, then I'll come back and I'll go one more time. Once it starts opening up, it's get, getting that first split so it starts splitting down. Once it starts, then you can really, a lot easier feel where you're going, but it's getting that first part of it away from the skin so that you've actually got two pieces in your hand instead of one for the most part oops little nick for the most part yeah I make them nicks just so I can keep practice sewing it's actually my favorite thing to do is sew hope you heard the sarcasm in that
there. We've got the lips opened up. You've seen what they look like before. Now you're going to see something totally different. See how them lips are opened up? They're all just laid wide open. The nose is laid wide open for you. And as I said, we'll make sure all the, we got no chunks of cartilage or anything on the skin because that, especially that cartilage will keep the keep the salt from penetrating. If the salt doesn't penetrate that hydrate, you won't get a good cure and you'll get a slip spot there. So the eyes, I'm just going to go around the eyes pretty much the same as the lips. I ain't going to go all the way to the edges now, I do that more later, but I want to thin them out enough so the salt can get in, so these real thick spots I'm just trimming down, taking it off or at least opening it up. Once you do a few you'll get what I'm saying, I just thinned a bunch, I just moved all that skin from there to there to open that eye up a little so I get good salt penetration. If you're going to tan these yourselves, some people would trim everything right now and so it's ready when they go. It all depends on your situation. Mine, mine is skinning time of the year. I'm usually busy. I want to get skin in the salt as fast as I can so I can go on to the next project and keep everything fresh. You know, it all depends on how busy you are and what your, what your schedule for that day shows. But that's the head ready to be salted. Now we're going to move on to the paws. We'll lay the paw down. There's a lot of different ways to do these paws. My way is I start right at this pad behind the toes. I go through the pad. Usually if they've skinned down, I'll go right to where they've skinned to, otherwise I try to stay down the center of the leg. But I'm just going to go through, I go through the center of the pad instead of opening the pad up all the way around. I'd rather sew that pad back by the center and make one short fix than to go all the way around that pad. Some people go around the pad and take it all off that way. My bigger bears, when they come in, that's usually how they're cut because that's the only way they can get stuff out. Some people, if they're salt and stuff, but... That's their way of doing it. This foot's still somewhat froze, but it needs the side needs to get in the salt, so I gotta work it this way. I'm just kind of skinning this foot back. Same as I would anything else. I'm just completely going down over the foot until we get down to the paws. Scalpel, knife, whatever you feel comfortable with here. Now we're actually going to remove these toe bones all the way down to right behind the claw this morning because when you go to mount it you don't want them toe bones in there they'll just cause problems on the mount for the mounting procedure they'll cause problems in the tanning procedure so we have to skin as down as far as we can on these toes at this point we at least want to get half to three quarters inch below these knuckles and since we're in the shop I'll show you the easy way to take them, to them bones out of the toes but you still have to get down at least a half inch below below these knuckles so we can get them put in the vise. Then I just take my knife. You can take a side cutter if you want, but I'll use a knife and I'll cut through the through the joints. 
learn to take them joints off with a knife, you're, you make your job a whole lot easier when you learn how, when you learn how these joints work, but it's, it's a practice deal. When I'm caping deer off the head or anything, I've, I've taught myself how to cut through them joints and cut them tendons so that they all come off. Right now you have five individual toes because you've seen I went through them all with my knife to open them up. That way they're individual so when we go to our vise and pull the toes, we can pull them out. We've now got all of our toes opened up. I clamped the toe bone, that's why we need that half inch in the vise. I keep my hands dry again with Borax. And I just work down until I get to that last joint. Now I've done enough, I know where it's at. You're gonna have to feel it out a few times, but right there is that last joint. We've got her completely out. We do that with all 20 toes on the bear. Just keep repeating that same step. I like the vise because I can keep pressure on it. If I was out in the open, I'd have to find another way to keep pressure, hopefully with a, with a leatherman and a second person, or you know, you just have to figure out a way to do it if you're out in the woods. I've never had to do one in the woods, so. I know with the pliers, I've done them with the pliers before. And it works, but. There's what your toe looks like, completely turned inside out. That's the back of the claw right there. If you ever find a claw to study, you would find that. But here again is why you learn, have to learn how to take stuff off at the joints because these toes are all being taken right off at that last joint. I'll just repeat that on all four feet. Then we'll turn them back inside right and salt them when we get to the salt. At this point we've got all the toes removed, the head turned, we're ready to flesh, flesh this thing. I use a fleshing beam now for the first 20 years of business. I did it with a knife, just laid it out on the table and took all that excess fat and meat off of the knife. I bought a fleshing beam, taught myself how to use it with a draw knife, but you want to make sure you get the majority of that excess meat and fat off so that the salt will penetrate the hide. Um, I'm hoping to have a professional video, have a fur buyer do some demonstrations and tell you the proper technique of using a draw knife. Anything I know I've taught myself. I can't tell you if I'm doing it right or wrong, but I can do it five times faster with this than I ever could with a knife, so just keep it tight on that beam. And work it off. Big thing is you keep it tight and flat on the beam so you don't put holes in it. Just keep working around the beam. And This is a time consuming, probably takes as long, used to take as long when I did it with a knife to flesh these properly as it did to take the head out and do the ears and the lips and the toes. Now I've got it down to probably a 10 or 15 minute deal, but it's still time consuming, but it's important because otherwise your salt won't penetrate and huge chance if it don't cure right, that it'll go bad in tanning. So,
There's going to be some areas yet you'll have to do with a knife, I'm sure, that you can't get the draw knife into right. Like I said, I hope to have a professional video on here eventually. If not, when we start sometime down the line, that you guys can either rent or and watch be done. Maybe I can get it to be part of the monthly training. You know, some videos I'm gonna have to charge for it. Some not, but. Probably the hardest part is learning how to keep this knife sharp. I just use my steel and sharpen it best I can. This one's getting some pretty good nicks in it. I'm either going to have to get a different knife or find someone that knows how to professionally sharpen them. But I've been using this knife for probably eight, eight nine years now, ten years, so. You know, we don't do a lot of bears, but we'll do a dozen a year on average, probably. But basically, you get the idea of this. We're just going to keep, keep at this until we get all the excess fat and meat off this hide so that we feel comfortable salting it. You know, it won't be perfect, but I got to get enough off that the salt goes through. We're in the final stages of taking care of this bear. Since they didn't get a measurement for us off the carcass, I got to somehow come up with a measurement close so I know approximately what body to order so at least I'm close. So I'm going to lay this bear out, I'm going to stretch it. I ain't going to stretch, stretch, but I'm going to make sure it's pulled good all the way. As you can see, if I pull sideways, it shortens up lengthways. I'm just trying to get a nice even feel to this bear as I lay it out. I'm going to lay my tape out. Now the first process is, there's a video marking hides. I show you how I kept track of people's hides so I know whose is whose on that video. This one, I'll log in the book under this guy's name. And it's actually number 115. So I'm going to make use my scalpel. Don't make any bigger holes than you have to. Make sure you go completely through the hider. It won't show up when it comes back from tanning. But I'm going to go a 1. A 1. And then the next line is going to have 5. So it's going to be 1, 1, 5. 1, 1, 5 is my marking on this hide. So that'll tell me whose hide, whose hide this is when it comes back from tanning. Now since I don't have a body measurement and this is life size, I'm going to take the measurement off the... Well the first measurement I'm going to do is the skull. I'm going to do a, where the end of the nose should be. This is about four and three quarters to the back of the skull is about eleven. So I'm going to record them, them numbers as three and three quarters actually. And eleven. So we got three and three quarters by 11. My next measurement is going to be the length from the nose to the base of the tail. This one's 54 inches. And I'm going to take a girth measurement right behind the arms here of 31. So, yeah, actually 32. So we got three and three quarters by 11 by 54 by 32. So I'm going to write them numbers down so I got track of them. They'll go on my computer and stay. under his name. The next process we got left in this bear, I'm going to use more salt since it's in my shop. If I was out in the woods doing this, I'd probably want about 25 pounds of salt for a bear this size. Today we're probably going to use both. As you can see, I've got the majority of the fat and meat off. There's little bits of pieces. That it'll still cure through that little bit. 
So I'm just going to pour some fine rock salt, non-iodized rock salt on it. I probably just poured on about 35 pounds. I've got it all laid out flat. I'm just going to start spreading that. I like to put a little, little bit inside the ears to kill the bacteria. I don't know, bears, I just do that. Get a little inside the head area, mouth area. Make sure you get this. Now right here on the back, I'm going to leave a fairly good amount. I want to make sure my ears get completely covered with salt. Get underneath on the throat area here covered. Out into my paws, I'll make sure I push the salt down in them paws so I it cures good around them toes, otherwise them toenails will rot off and come off in tanning. The tannery actually likes you to put a staple in them. Before you send them in, you can just pop a staple in there with a good staple gun. But make sure you get the underneath of this head and jaw because now we're going to have to roll this part forward so we can do the top of the head and leave it. So we want to make sure that's got a good layer of salt on it. You want to make sure the lips don't curl over. You just work all areas to make sure that salt covers all areas. Even for in my shop, 35 pounds of salt was a great plenty for this bear. So I know out in the woods I could have probably got by with 20 on a bear this size. But if I'm out bear hunting personally, I don't want to shoot a four and a half foot bear. I want to shoot a six foot foot bear. So a six foot bear is of course it's going to be bigger so you're going to need if, if I was going in the woods I if it was real hard to get it in I'd take minimum 25 pounds of salt in if I could drive my truck to where I was going to be I'd throw the whole bag in and I'd take 50 pounds in per bear just just because you, you can kin there's a properly salted hide we'll let that hide cure for seven to ten days before we pull it out of that salt and Lay it up. Now if you really want to do it right, you can put it on a draining rack that's slanted so all the moisture drains off and runs away. I've actually got a different place I can salt this bear and I'll move it. But for purpose of the video, I had to keep it out in the open here where I could show you pictures. But at this point, that bear is ready to cure. Seven to ten days, dry it and ship it to the tannery. For the final part of this video, we're going to use a mounted life-size bear due to the fact that we don't get bears in here often enough to show you the procedures for different things, but we started out this morning with a bear with a skull in it and the paws in it and skinned it and got it to the salt. We're going to assume that you're out in the woods and you have the complete carcass there and need to know how to make your cuts to get the carcass off. Now. If you, if you don't know if it's going to be a life size or a rug, let's always assume it's going to be a rug and we'll make our cuts for a rug. That way the cuts I'm going to show you can be used for a life size, but we'll make a really good rug. When you make them cuts, you lay the bear out, it'd be laid on its back, you'd start on the paw right in, right? You can start right behind the toes if you want or you can start on the back side of the pad but cut down to the first elbow of that bear. And then unlike caping a deer, where you stay on that back part and then cut to the center of the body, we're gonna change our direction a little here so that we get a wider rug and we don't cut this brisket part out and make a skinny bear back there. So when you get to that first elbow, you're gonna turn and go on the inside and you're gonna come up into this area of the bear in here. That way all this part will be back in here to make your nice wide rug instead of up here where it's got to be trimmed off. So when you get to that first joint on the front, you're going to make that cut and come up here towards the throat area. Now if it's possibly light, if it's totally going to be a rug, you can start right here and make this cut down the center of the body all the way to the anus and stay in the center if it's going to be a rug. If it's going to be a life size, Stay where you come to this, bring these arms together, because you'll do the same thing in this arm, you'll bring it into here. 
where you bring this cut together, start at that point and go down. Now, if it's going to be a life size possible and it's a male, go around the scrotum and the testicles. Leave them on one side or the other of the skin so that they can be taken care of properly and back to the original state. If you cut through them, sometimes they're hard to get back in the position just where you want them. But that would be the front cuts for either rug or or life size, you do them. The back cuts, same thing, you're going to either start right behind the toes and go through the pad, following the back of the leg to the anus. Stay on the back side, whether it's a rug or a life size, you can stay right on the back side of that. Now always cut with your knife from the inside out so you don't cut the hair. Always keep sliding it and pulling out. Don't saw into it. And always go from the front to the back when you're doing the front from the body and legs always start at the foot and go to the tail. Lay them both open that way. Skin that bear out just like you would any other animal and then go through at that point you would have when you get to the wrist you can cut the wrist off at the joint or that's that would be your easiest point and then take it and do it like we did the steps at the beginning of this video. If you have the full body, and this should be done, the hunters should be taught how to do this. Any of you hunters out there that want your, your skin to be back and, and you want to know how far the body is, they have a tendency of stretching bears when they tell you it's a 10 footer or a 6 footer. A true measurement for a life size is going to be before you skin it, you lay that tape right on that nose, you go right down the center of the back, and you measure it right to the base of the tail. This will measure 63 inches. The next measurement I want will be right behind these legs. This is going to be a tougher one to make, but work your tape under that body. Run it behind them legs. And give me that measurement. This one happens to be 47. You can also give me one at the biggest point around the belly and that happens to be 50. You can log those three measurements for your tax service plus take him to skull and he'll, be, he'll best be able to record your size of your body to get the best life size mount that he can out of your animal. Those measurements will get you a better mount every time no matter the quality of your taxidermist. If you can give him those measurements you will considerably help him and you'll considerably give yourself a better mount. That would conclude anything you need to know about skinning and prepping a bear and getting it ready to go to your taxidermist or getting it ready to go to the tannery. Depends on who you are.